Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We want to be prompt to give our speakers the time that they've been allotted. As you're seated, if you could do at least one thing for me, if you have one of these obnoxious or helpful devices, please make sure it's at least on vibrate or off, but whatever is necessary so that it's silent. If you have need of uh, hearing help, uh, there are um, uh, devices that are available. They're in a little box right here behind Justin Kaufman. Just switch that on and that'll help you with your hearing. You can grab that afterwards. If the light goes off, that means the battery's dead. Just grab another one. Uh, but if you're done using it, please turn it all the way off. Our theme for the convention is the faithful gospel preacher. We were greatly challenged last night by Dr. Saunders. That was a tremendous blessing. We begin today with our, the focus, the reason we are faithful gospel preachers, and we must be, is, and that is because our Savior. Our devotional today is the Savior of the faithful gospel preacher. And uh, Je pa Brother Justin Kaufman pastors the Faith Baptist Church in Kittery, Maine. We had our convention there a couple years ago. Brother Justin will come and bring the word, and then we'll be led in prayer by a couple of our gentlemen. Good morning. Glad to be with you this morning. The sun is finally starting to go down so I can see. I stood up here when I first came in and I thought to myself, how is this going to work uh, with the sun? But that's okay. I'll just be illuminated for you. You'll take your Bibles and open to Revelation chapter 1. It is a privilege to share the Word of God with you this morning. It is the topic of the Savior, the faithful preacher of the gospel. As I thought about our Savior, the world sees our Lord as somebody who was weak, somebody who died on the cross, somebody who could not save himself. They think of Christ as the effeminate pictures that hang on their walls, but they don't see the majesty of our Savior. And as I was contemplating what to share, Revelation 1 came to my mind in the vision that John had, the majesty of our Savior there. Now just a few passing words on Philippians chapter 2. We're familiar with uh, the humbling of Jesus of himself, taking on the limitations of mankind, taking on those limitations. He stooped down from heaven to this earth. He came and he died for us to provide us a wonderful salvation relationship to our Father. And we see that beautiful picture there in the book of Philippians of him humbling himself and going to the cross. But then I was um, focused on John the Apostle here in Revelation chapter 1, and I think of, in some ways, a little bit of a different picture of our Messiah. We see him in his glorified appearance here in Revelation chapter 1. And as we read this and look at these verses, and I'll be looking at verses 9 through 18, imagine being John that day on the island of Patmos. I'm sure he didn't wake up that morning realizing he was going to have this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you'll follow with me, I'll read from verse 9 down to verse 18, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, 
and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Can you imagine being John that day? He's the only remaining apostle. He is banished to the small island of Patmos, this small barren island found in the Aegean Sea. Uh, My understanding is quite mountainous and rocky, very barren, maybe a few other people there, but he may be alone. But he's exiled. And why is he exiled, verse 9? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And as he's there one particular day, he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. That would arrest your attention, wouldn't it? All of a sudden, this, this voice as a trumpet. Christ is summoned this aged apostle with this great voice of a trumpet. Remember that God broke the silence at Mount Sinai with the sound of a trumpet. God will arrest our attention. Joseph Seiss, commenting on this, says, it was intended to fix the attention of the seer and assure him of the divinity of the speaker and of the importance of what was to follow. And he had quite a message for John, did he not? The voice is the voice of our wonderful Lord, giving John this powerful message. But through this, John sees this vision of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. He turns to see what the voice is. Can you imagine what happens when you turn around? What he saw? The Son of Man? There's this term, the Son of Man, both a messianic title, Daniel 7, 13 through 14, but also a description of royalty and one who judges. John 5.27 says, And have given to him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. He has this robe, this garment, that extends down to the feet, with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. Here I think possibly both the, the the priestly aspect, but also the high rank and dignity of our Lord. He is royalty. He is the conquering king. He's not the effeminate picture that hangs on the wall of people's homes. But he's a conquering king. He's a judge. Arlen Chitwood comments, the girdle placed about the shoulders or breast indicates a magisterial function. You notice in verse 14, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes Where's a flame of fire? You know, it's as if as John dis- describes this picture, he tries to put into human terms what he sees. It must have been difficult. But he sees this head and hairs white like wool in the snow. Uh, I think descriptive here of, of eternality, but also of wisdom and dignity found with age. He has the wisdom of eternity. Can we not trust our Savior? Can we not go to our Savior when we have difficulties and trials and tribulations? We don't have to go to books for wisdom. We don't have to go to others, although that can be helpful at times, but we have a Savior. We have his word. He's the wisdom of eternity. But I think also here we have a picture 
And I think John is, in a way, reminding us that Jesus is full deity, too. He has the same purity as the Father. These attributes are the same as the Father in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Now, I understand that in Daniel 7, 9, there is a difference of opinion. Some think it's the Lord Jesus. Some think it's the Father. I believe it's talking of the Father there. I think verse 13, then, it talks about the Lord Jesus. But I believe in Daniel 7, 9, it's talking about the Father. And I think what John's doing here is reminding us that this one that he saw is full deity. And Daniel 7, 9 says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as a burning fire. He continues with the description, these eyes as a flame of fire. I mean, again, how, how do you take that in to see what John saw that day? These eyes as a flame of fire that, to burn or to shine, the omniscient intelligence and the penetrating insight of our Lord. Can you imagine what it will be like when he examines us? And he is examining us. He watches us. He knows what we do. We can't hide anything from the gaze of our Lord. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Christ sees everything. He knows everything. We're not going to hide things from him. So, uh, last night, our brother said about being in the study alone. And you have your computer. We read of pastors falling all the time. Do we think we're beyond that? We don't guard ourselves. We too can fall. But if we can remember that our Lord is watching, his eyes are a flame of fire, this penetrating insight. We need to keep the picture of our Savior before us. We need to be reminded of his majesty, his authority, his power, and his glory. His eyes as a flame of fire. I can't imagine. In verse 15, it says, his feet like unto fine brass and bronze. I think the idea here of divine glory, purity, stability. And in a way, maybe another symbol of judgment. It kind of takes our attention back to the brazen altar where the fire of God's judgment burned. But also remember that he is walking amidst the churches. John sees him amidst the candlesticks. Therefore, we also find our Lord chastening to instill purity and stability in us. He moves on. He talks about the voice like a sound of raging water. You ever been to Niagara Falls? Anybody here ever at Niagara Falls? Kind of hard when you're standing there to hear the person beside you, isn't it? It's loud. The raging waters. And John tries to explain that the voice of Christ is like the voice of raging water. Christ's voice is commanding. It's overpowering. It's full of authority. As I was meditating on that, I thought about John 18. Remember in John chapter 18, the Roman soldiers, along with the temple guard, came uh, to the garden to arrest Jesus. They were looking for Jesus. Judas, of course, was leading them. And the picture seems to be there in that passage when you look at the Greek and everything that's going on there. It almost appears as if Jesus comes out of the garden or out of the darkness, and he comes out and he appears before these soldiers. And when he appears before them, he asks them, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus. And what did he say? I am he. And what happened in the account of John? They recoiled, they stumbled, they fell back. Could you imagine that picture? When he said, I am he, ego a me, I am he, they stumbled and they fell backwards. Why? Well, there may be several reasons why. I think the unexpected approach of Christ coming to them, I think the, the great dignity of our Lord, the calmness, the sudden commanding voice, the determined, unafraid look in his eyes, I'm not sure, but they fell backwards. And these were soldiers, my friend. But his voice commanded, I am he. The voice of authority. 
He gives his decrees and he will pass his judgments. Verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. He holds the messengers in his right hand, I think a symbol of authority, sovereignty, power, possession, and protection. I know, again, there's debate over the messengers. Are they angels? Are they pastors? I feel they're pastors. You can disagree. That's fine. But we're in his right hand, a symbol of authority and protection. And it says a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. The judgment of his enemies. His word will be the basis of all judgment. His word discerns the intentions of our hearts. He knows. And notice his countenance. It says in the end of verse 16, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The countenance, is it his, uh, uh, his face or is it the full appearance of Jesus? Either way, the brilliance and the holiness and the majesty of what John saw that day. Can you imagine? And what did John do? Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I suppose every one of us would. It must have shook him to his core to see the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ that day before. And remember, friends, this is John. This is John that walked with Jesus for three, three and a half years. This is John that had a very close relationship with our Lord. This is the one that reclined on his bosom. He knew Jesus. He walked with Jesus, but he never saw Jesus this way. In his glorified appearance. And when John saw him that way, he fell to his face as dead. Can you imagine? How would you have responded? Friends, we need to see our Lord in his full majesty. We need to understand this is the Lord that we serve. The world doesn't understand our Lord, but we are responsible before him. He is our master. He is our Lord. He deserves our respect and our full submission. He has authority over us. I thought of a few other, and you might want to write these down and maybe use this as a private devotion someday. I I looked at Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 to 15. Before Joshua went into the battle of Jericho, he did a reconnaissance mission that night. And I believe there he saw the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, the great warrior standing. And remember, Joshua, are you for me? Are you with us or against us? And what did Joshua do? He fell on his face. And in worship and adoration. The pre-incarnate Lord would appear and reminded him that there's victory in Christ. And friends, for you and I, when we are serving him faithfully, there's victory. We might not see all the results, but how could we ever see all the results that, that God is doing? But there's victory in Christ and there's victory in his message. What about Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and he saw there uh, a veiled yet glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus And what did he do? He said, woe is me, for I am undone. The word there really is the idea, I am ruined. Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28, at Ezekiel's calling, and he sees this glorious vision. And what does he do? In verse 28, he falls upon his face. And remember Peter in Luke chapter 5. They fish all night. They didn't catch a thing. The crowds are kind of... There with Jesus, Jesus goes into Peter's boat. He pushes off out into the water. Jesus tells him to drop his nets. Can you imagine telling this fisherman, well, there's nothing there to catch. Jesus says, drop your nets. And you remember what happened. The great catch. Do you remember how Peter responded? Luke 5, 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, leave me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Friends, these responses are quite instructive to us. Friends, we must see our majestic Lord as he really is. 
in all his beauty, in all his majesty, his holiness, his power, his authority, and his sovereignty. How could we ever take him lightly? If we can see what John saw, and we see it through the lens of Scripture, correct? How can we ever take him lightly? How can we ever doubt his ways, ignore his instructions, or somehow think that we know better than him, that we can run the church better than he can? And yet there are a multitude of pastors and churches throughout our nation who think they can do it better than God's word. And what happens? They fail. What the church needs today, what you and I need today, is to remember who's in control, and we need to remember the majesty of our Lord. And we as individuals need to remember that he has full authority and he has a right to run our lives and to remember that we will stand before him one day and give an account. Friends, we press forward by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, but the one who's also coming back to completely rule and reign. We need to keep that vision of our Savior before us to keep us strong, to keep us faithful, because he is the savior of the faithful preacher of the gospel. That is our Lord. And it would do us quite well to often meditate on his majesty and his glory. It'll keep us focused. It'll keep us faithful. Let's pray. Father, we just barely scratched the surface of the majesty of our savior but, oh, Father, protect us, strengthen us, remind us, rebuke us, challenge us. Whatever is needed in each heart this morning, Father, may we be reminded of the power and the majesty and the authority of the one we serve and the one we bow the knee to. May he be our strength. May he be our guidance. Father, may we serve him faithfully so that we can hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, Father, help us to keep Christ ever before us, not the effeminate Christ of this world, but the power and the majesty of the true Christ who's coming again. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time... We're going to have Brother Matt Ryder and then Cliff Cawthorn lead us in prayer this morning. The request that I was given to pray for, um, please remember the Field family. Um, Dr. Field's wife passed away. And the funeral is at 2 o'clock. Um, and then also remember um, Mrs. Colas. When we come together, there's memories from me as a child coming to the American Council and then um, as a pastor. Um, both of these ladies exemplified character um, and their support of their husbands and just their attitudes. So we need to pray for them and then also pray for our speaker to come. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you um, for the opportunity to come into your presence, Lord. We thank you for the devotion, Lord, and just the encouragement and being reminded of who you are, Lord. We pray that you would encourage the Field family, Lord. We just pray again um, for this church and school that um, has been established by the Fields, Lord. We just pray that you would strengthen them and just the extended family, Lord, that you would encourage them today, Lord. And then we pray for um, Mrs. Colas, Lord, and just that you would just encourage her and strengthen her physically, Lord. And just the testimony of character that these ladies have exemplified to me as a young person and to so many others, Lord. We just pray that you would strengthen them, Lord. We just pray for um, Brother Myers, Lord, as he comes to preach the word, Lord, that you would just give him the words to say. That you would encourage him, that you would strengthen him in his ministry, Lord. And we just pray that you would continue to bless this, um, these meetings, Lord. That you would challenge us and that you would give us guidance in Jesus' name. Amen.
We pray, Lord, that you would save them. We pray that you would help them to grow in Christ. We pray that you would uh, help them to live lives that are separated unto you and apart from the world. We pray for this generation that you might be gracious and send your spirit of revival to save them and to see this generation change through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for uh, our speaker, Jonathan Smith, as he comes this morning and brings the word, that you would uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit and help him to give us what we need for this hour. We pray for discernment, that you would just help us to uh, understand what is right, then give us the strength by your spirit to do what is right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We can
Good morning. Would you take your hymn book, number 568? May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. Let's stand. We'll sing three stanzas, the first, the fifth, and the sixth. We'll stand and sing. 568. to see you here this morning. I'm going to be asking Reverend Greenfield to lead us in prayer, and after that he'll introduce our preacher for our session this morning, and then our brother will come and preach the word. So Reverend Greenfield will come now and lead us in prayer. Great God in heaven, thank you for the word that we've heard this morning. Thank you for the reminder of how glorious and great our Savior is. Thank you, Lord, that though the world and the nations may rail against him, as we know from Psalm 2, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Thank you that he is our Savior, and he is our Lord, and he is the one that we serve. Lord, help us to be faithful in this calling that you have issued to us. We have much, Lord, that we have to repent of, and so I pray as we hear your word now this morning, Lord, from your servant, as we are reminded and taught of the character that must be ours as faithful gospel preachers, that we will hear the word, Lord, not with a a prideful, stubborn resistance or a self-righteousness, but, Lord, with a ready heart to hear, to act, to repent and confess our sin, and Lord, to ask that you will uh, help us to be more like your son. We ask God your blessing on our brother as he brings the word this morning. We pray that you'll help him to know just the right words to say, but we're thankful, Lord, that the power of your word uh, is effective, as we were reminded last night. It will accomplish what you send it to do. Please bless our time, but most importantly, may you be glorified, may Christ be exalted, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated.
This session will address the character of the faithful gospel preacher. We need to have that biblical, Christ-like character uh, in our lives to be his faithful servants. Our speaker this morning is Pastor Gary Myers. He has been pastor of the Biblical Baptist Church in Meshoppin, Pennsylvania for over 40 years. And that is a, a joy and an encouragement and a challenge uh, to aspire to. He also serves presently as the president of the Fellowship of Fundamental Bible Churches, and we welcome him to the pulpit of the American Council of Churches that he'll bring the word this morning. One of the things I always, um, I'm afraid of that I'm not gonna be able to make it up the uh, stairs. I always think I'm gonna trip and fall. It actually happened to a friend of mine. Uh, a couple years ago, he was asked to preach a funeral and there were steps like that and he tripped and fell flat on his face. And so, glad that didn't happen. Um, but I'm glad to be here. It was really, it's been a great, great uh, conference so far. Um, even the business, the business session was a real blessing. I appreciate being able to um, sit in on that. Um, the resolutions, and of course, we got to hear them all yesterday. And uh, then the message last night, Brother Saunders, great challenge, and the message this morning. I thought that was really, that was a neat illustration. Don't you love it when God does the illustrating, when he, he read that passage about, as the sun <laughs> shineth in his strength. But it is great to be here. My wife wanted to be here. Um, the, a month ago today, she had her right hip replaced. Um, she's doing quite well, but her therapist said that she, that she didn't want her coming down. My wife said, I'm only going to miss one session of therapy. But they said, no, we don't want her to go anyplace. So, so she's home, and, and I'm here. And uh, just please, please continue to pray for my wife, Jan. She's doing really, really well in the therapy. Uh, Again, I praise the Lord to, to see some guys and, that I've known for years and to make, meet some new guys and to renew some acquaintances. And uh, I'm in uh, northeast Pennsylvania, a little town called Meshoppin, and I was born and raised even farther up in the corner. Um, I just wanted to just mention a little bit, you know, something how the Lord, how the Lord does things in our lives and we're not even sure, we don't know it maybe until years later, um, but I grew up in, a, in the farthest thing from a Christian home. My dad was a was a just a, a real drunkard, and um, him and my him and my mom split up. He left, and he was you know always chasing women, doing stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of ironic that I'm preaching on character because I didn't I grew up with a father who didn't who had none. Praise the Lord! I th I really believe that just about a month before he died, I did have the opportunity to give him the gospel, and he did submit to it and did receive Christ as a savior. Praise the Lord for that. But um, when I was about five years old, he had me come and sit by him in the living room. And here's a guy that had nothing to do with the Lord, nothing to do with church, nothing to do with the Bible. So he sat me down, and he opened the Bible, and he read Genesis chapter 1 to me. As a, when I was five years old, I never, ever forgot that. And... Uh, as I look back, the Lord started doing something back then. I, I didn't realize it till later that that one little session with my dad, maybe five minutes, no, he, didn't, he didn't explain anything, he just read it. It created in my heart um, a love for the Bible. I wasn't even, I wasn't even saved yet. Um, and so the Lord, you know, through our moving to a little town of Springville, a neighbor lady, the day that we moved in, went and visited my mom and asked if she could take me to Sunday school. So at eight years old, started going to Sunday school, and the pastor of the Springville Baptist Church, Pastor Wilbur McCullough, um, led me to the Lord after an evening service on one Sunday night, and the Lord just began to work um, in my life. I'm very, very thankful for that, um, what the Lord has done and what he continues to do. And so um, let's get into the scriptures and Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 was the text that was uh, sent to me along with the letter inviting me, asking me if I would bring a message on the character of the faithful preacher of the gospel. And really what we're talking about is the character of Christ and one of, the, one of the things that God seeks to do in all of our lives is conform us to the image of his dear son. And so we're talking about really Christ-like character. 
And so let's read the passage, Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then we'll pray and then we'll get into the message. Um, Titus chapter 1, verse 6 says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father and our great God, we're so thankful for, the, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for all that he is and for all that he's done for us. We're thankful for that, just that great reminder this morning from Revelation 1 of his majesty, his glory. We're thankful that he has, that he condescended to come to this world and to bear our sins in his own body, to shed his precious blood, that we could be saved. We're thankful for uh, the Spirit of God who works in us. We're thankful for the Word of God. Lord, how precious the Scripture is to us. May it be more so uh, each day that we live upon this earth. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the help of the Holy Spirit uh, to bring forth this message that, uh, this morning, that it would be a help and an encouragement and a challenge. And Lord, Father, as I even went through these Scriptures, there were s several times I just had to stop and and pray and ask thee to uh, mold these character traits into my life more and more. And Father, I pray that you would help us as we go through this passage this morning. In Christ's precious name, amen. When I received this request and, and agreed to it, I started thinking, of course, immediately about the passage of Scripture, about the character of the faithful preacher of the gospel. And one of the first verses that came to my mind uh, was the scripture that says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, realizing that this character that God's word requires of the pastor, um, preacher of the gospel, is absolutely contrary to our nature. And you all know that. We realize that. And I appreciated the message last night, brother. And one of the things that really helped me was when you said you weren't going to give us anything new. Because <laughs> I figured when I was going to, I thought, you know, nothing new here. Everyone very familiar with these verses and these passages. But we do, we need to be reminded. We need to be encouraged and challenged, um, in the, especially um, in this day in which we live. And this is a very uh, powerful and important um, passage of scripture with regard to the preacher of the gospel. And so um, in, this, in the text, three verses, uh, Titus chapter 1, verses 6, 7, 8, and we'll look at three, three major things in regard to the character of the faithful preacher um, of the gospel. I appreciate it so much that hymn, May the Mind of Christ by Savior. And as we're singing that, I was also, and I was thinking beforehand, of that hymn, I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be, I would be pure, for there are those who care. And uh, what, an, what an awesome uh, responsibility that we have, you know, a great privilege. We have a, a holy calling uh, from the Lord. Uh, and, and I believe that with all my heart that God called us. And, and, I, belie and, and I believe without any, any doubt at all that the Lord called me in my life when I was a teenager, about 15 years old. And I, I praise the Lord for that. And, and after being a pastor now for be 42 years next month, Lord willing, by the grace of God, I just still marvel um, at the fact that God would call me into the ministry and the, the, just the, the great privilege that we have to, to study um, the Word of God, to preach His Word. I mean, just... I've never, I've never gotten over that and, and just never lost the marvel of, the, of God's grace in, in the whole aspect of ministry. And so there are three things um, that we are to look at here in this passage of Scripture that talk about the character of the faithful preacher of the gospel. And then in verse 6 begins, I, I notice the first three words, if any be. He, and you know that and Paul left Titus there in Crete and he was to set things in order, he was to ordain elders, or he was to put men in the ministry. And he says, if any be. In other words, these are the kind of men it, that you need to ordain 
and place in the ministry. They must be these kind of men. And so, number one, are the character of the faithful preacher of the gospel um, as a family man. Now, it says there, it starts off with, if any be blameless. And so, of course, that covers the whole realm of the character of the faithful preacher of the gospel. It's also mentioned in verse 7. If any be blameless, and that obviously the, the word blameless there is free from accusation, without reproach, uh, nothing that can be laid to one's charge. Now, obviously, we are not, we can never become sinless in this life, but we can and must, by the grace of God, be blameless. We need to be above reproach um, in our ministry. And so then he goes, the first thing, I noticed in 1 Timothy 3, the same approach by Paul there, he goes right to the family aspect. Um, he says, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, and literally the, the, a one woman, the man of one woman, or a one woman man, but it certainly also necessitates one wife. You know, one wife, um, but a, a man who is faithful, true um, to his wife. And we can look at many aspects of that, but in a couple verses I would just uh, have written down here, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved, also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And in Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So the... And I believe that because Ephesians chapter 5 uses the relationship of husband and wife to illustrate that of Christ the church and vice versa, that it, it, to me that in, indicates that um, our personal relationship with the Lord is number one. But other than that, it's our relationship with our wife that takes priority over every other earthly relationship. Um, and, I, I have, and I have thanked God I don't know how many times, maybe not enough, but for the precious wife that he gave to me. I'll tell you, she, she is, and I mentioned to, to Brother Joe this morning, you know, she is my most earnest supporter and my harshest critic, all right? And I say that, in the, in the, and I probably a lot, of you, a lot of you men, pastors can say the same thing, but um, I could not be and do what I've done over the years without her being beside me. She's a, she is a tremendous help in the ministry, and I'm, I'm sorry that she isn't able um, to be here um, today. In fact, I always feel like part of me is missing when I go to uh, something, you know, something like this, and she's not with me to be able to share in the blessing, and especially to be able to hear somebody else preach for a change. I know she, she loves to do that. So, um, but I just appreciate her, um, and she's been a, tr a tre tremendous wife, a great mom, a grandmother now. Um, you know, she's a teacher in the church. She works with the ladies. I mean, she just does all kinds of things. And a few years ago, one of our men came up to me, and he meant this in the best way. He said, you know, Pastor, I think you're, in some ways your wife does more than you do. <laughs> and he meant that, in, I mean, he meant that in a good way. So I do, I appreciate her so very much. And, and uh, just the, the relationship that we have, um, and, you know, she is, she is my best friend. I mean, there's no doubt, no question about that. Uh, my favorite person to pray with. I mean, we just, we just have just a wonderful time um, being married 42 years and, and serving the Lord together. And so that's so important. And um, on our 40th anniversary, the, one of our, our head deacon after the morning service, he called my wife and I to come up to the front of the church and they presented us with a card and so forth and then he said I mean everybody's he had everybody just about bawling but he said to me he said you know pastor and Jan um, above everything else we want you we want to thank you um, for being an example to us of what a married couple is supposed to be and folks that 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 was that was the night greatest thing that they ever could have said about us and I mean God gets all the glory and because uh, it's not it's not in me it's not in me to be a godly husband or, or father um, but by the grace of God we, we, we can do that we want to do that the longing of my heart is to do that 
And we have five children. They're all grown up. They're all in there from 35 to 42 years old. They're out on their own. They have families. We have 15 grandchildren. And so my wife and I have just prayerfully now uh, taken on our grandchildren as a, as a, just as a mission um, to see how we can have an influence on them. And so um, it's very, just so important. It goes, of course, speaking of children, it goes on to say in verse 6, having faithful children, believing children, not accused of riot or unruly. And the, the text in Ephesians, again, talks about bringing up, bringing up our children, bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I see a connection there that our, our children, our believing children, if, they, if we bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And when our kids were being born, um, and as they grew, my wife and I, we prayed together, we talked about it together, and we just asked the Lord to please that they would come to us. I mean, we'd give them the gospel, they were in church and everything, and they would, we asked God, would you please make it so that when, when they're ready, when you, have, when you have prepared their hearts, that they would come to us and say, the Lord, you know, I need to be saved, or, you know, somehow, and, and that's what happened, and we, we praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that. It's all, it's all because of his grace and the power of his word. Now, it says not accused of riot, um, and it's the idea that not, not even, nothing that can be brought against them, riot is quite a word in the scripture, debauchery, dissipation, wildness, the for, a form of the same word is used in Luke 15 uh, to describe the prodigal son and his riotous living. Right? So that's, that's out. That can't happen. Uh, must not happen, I should say, in the lives of our children. And then the word unruly is the idea of rebellious, disobedient, or even the word independent. And we hear a lot about independence today among Young people, I've heard a few cases of, of children uh, uh, what, what, emancipated. Have you heard that? Where they can be emancipated from their parents and all that. And, and uh, we have a, a, a ministry with, with children in our church. We, we've had one, you know, almost since day one. By the way, I'm the result, as I mentioned, about the lady who came to visit and invited me to Sunday school. When I was a child, we moved around all over the place. I actually ended, attended like six different schools. And how long I had to do with my father's drinking and all that. But anyway, we moved from place to place. Um, and so it wasn't until we moved near to the town of Mahoopany that the Baptist church there had, actually had a bus ministry. And they started taking, you know, started taking us to church until we, we started to get um, grounded in the Word of God, and so then our then our my, our parents got saved. My mom had remarried, and, and she my stepdad and her um, we kept we were going to Sunday school and church. Somebody was t was very very faithful to take us every Sunday. I appreciate that very much. Anyway, um, so I wrote, I grew up at, that way. I was kind of a bus kid, and so among other things that you know that gave me a, an appreciation for those people. Uh, who used to take us to church and so that we've had the opportunity and some of us, others in our church have to bring kids in. What I said all that to say, unruliness seems to be the order of the day among the kids that we're working with. Now, and we, we just aren't, we're not giving up on them, um, but this, this group of kids, it, um, it just seems to be the most challenging, most difficult to work with today. Most of the kids that come in are from unsafe families and not even really families, you know, broken up and all that sort of thing. And so unruliness. And yet we have seen two or three of the, the, the kids uh, make professions of faith in Christ and we've seen some really, really great changes. We, we, we appreciate that very much. But, you know, it's because, I'm, I know I'm talking about the pastors, and, and, but, it, but it really comes down to the point where these kids today are not being raised with godly fathers, godly mothers, no discipline, you know, no standards, anything like that. Um, and so, we, certainly, we, and we do, we pray, my, my wife and I especially, uh, we pray for the children in our community, and pray for, we pray for the ones who minister to them. A couple ladies in our church especially, they, 
I mean, they, we know they just need special grace to, you know, to, to minister, um, deal with these children. And so, but God is able, God's able to change. He took a, a, an unruly kid like me, and he's been working on me for a long time. Um, and he, there's still um, a lot of work to do. But so, so the pastor has to have, be faithful in his character um, as a family man. Both of the guys who spoke before me mentioned pastors falling. And in the years that we've been in, in Meshapan, unfortunately, there has been about half a dozen fundamental pastors in our area who have fallen into some kind of sin and have been, you know, have left the ministry. And um, whenever that happens, and, and there's a couple of them that were actually, would be, I would consider them friends of mine in the past who have fallen, and usually, it's, it's moral, usually, um, and, you know, my first reaction was always like anger. Well, how can you do that? Well, then fear. <laughs> I think, man, if it can happen to that brother, it sure could happen to me. And so, and so we, we really are, are just really moved to pray that God will help us and help me. And I thank the Lord that he has kept, uh, kept me in, in a in, in great way. I praise the Lord um, for that. And... Uh, so we have, and we've, so uh, in order to help safeguard that, I have put some guidelines or whatever you want to call it, rules in my life and ministry as far as dealing with women. Now, and I don't know if you guys have this, up, but um, like just simply this, I will not talk to counsel a, a lady unless her husband is present or my wife is present. I just won't do that. And, you know, that's, that's being attacked today. I was on, a way, on my way to a meeting somewhere, probably a, a fellowship meeting, and I heard there was a, a Christian radio station. Don't know the station. I just happened to pick it up on the radio. And they were having a discussion about these types of things. And, and there was a pastor, and he, he said basically what I just said, that he has that policy. He will not counsel a woman alone. And, and he was torn apart by the others on this panel. Oh, how can you do that? You're treating lady this second class citizens and you have to, you know, you have to be alone at times. He said, I'm, no, he said, I'm sorry, I just, I just won't do that. So we, there's those, you know, those, those safeguards that we can put into place and trusting in the grace of God. Then just having the type of relationship with our wife that the scripture talks about. Is, is probably the biggest safeguard. And I, by the way, I appreciate my wife talking to ladies. I mean, she can deal with them better than I can, that's for sure. But So just that, so the family. Um, all right, let's take a look at the second. And really, it says in verse 7, for a bishop that is an overseer, minister, ministry in the church, a bishop must be blameless, the same word, as the steward of God. So take a look at verse 7. And verse 8, under the heading of being a steward of God. A, first of all, the, fir, the first thing about this, as a steward of God in what he refuses, or what he denies, what he avoids in his life. And again, uh, the word steward there, as you, as you know, means a manager, a trustee, and who's someone who's been entrusted by God with certain things that belong to him. And we, as pastors, preachers, um, we have been given a sacred trust. And the verse was referred to as required to stewards that a man be found faithful. Uh, ministers of Christ, it says before that, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, obviously, the, the word of God and, and the work of God, a marvelous, a sacred trust. Um, we have a marvelous privilege. I hope that I never forget that, and, and that you guys who are pastors never forget that it is not just, it's a sacred trust. It is a marvelous privilege um, to open God's word, to minister the scripture, whether it be behind pulpits or in homes or wherever it may be. And it's also, of course, an, an awesome responsibility. Um, God must be seen, not us. I kept this thing on because out of, out of respect to, you know, we're supposed to wear these, but I didn't want to wear it in the pulpit. I didn't want to be, I didn't want it to be me being seen. Uh, but seriously, but you know, it's God 
who needs to be seen. Christ needs to be seen. And so I I appreciate that hymn that we sang so much um, before this message. Um, So God must be seen, not us. You know, like John the Baptist, you know, who art thou? Who art thou? They ask him all these things. Are you the Christ? No. Are you that prophet? No. He says, what are you then? I am a voice. I'm a voice. Speaking for the Lord. And that's what we, we need to be. So here are some characteristics of what a uh, steward of God is, his character in what he refuses. So it says there, verse uh, 7, not self-willed. That simply means not overbearing not dominated by self-interest. Right? That's important. Jo- John wrote that Diotrephes loveth to have the preeminence. And we ought not to be that. The Bible says not self-willed. Not soon angry. Not quick-tempered or inclined to anger. We must not be an angry man. We can be Angry against sin, there is such a thing as righteous indignation, but some, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid maybe sometimes what we uh, pass off as righteous indignation is just simply anger, <laughs> you know, that God doesn't, uh, does not want us to have. Uh, I grew up, that was me as a kid, I had a terrible temper, um, and so I, I can certainly under relate to the idea of, of the anger aspect. Um, in fact, it was one of the things that when I was going over this, really ask God, please help me, help me not to be um, an angry man, right? Um, not given to wine is the next thing. Uh, not, just not uh, without drunkenness, uh, not given to drinking, and, and I don't know how, how you guys, I, I suppose I might be, I have a predetermined hatred for alcohol because of what I grew up in, in our home, my father. And uh, I used to, he used to take me with him. I, I went just to just to be with him. I was like you know just a little kid, five six years old, and adored my dad. Um, I would go anywhere he were with him, and so I would go. And he would drink and so on. Um, and so he that it, it ruined our family. And I just I think that sometimes we we lose that idea. We're so we talked about being desensitized because of what's all around us. Um, but my, our, my mom and dad, they, they split up when, when I was about nine to ten years old. They ended up getting divorced. She divorced him. They both were unsaved, and um, she just couldn't stand, couldn't tolerate the drinking and the running around and leaving her alone with four children. I was the oldest. I, could, I remember one night being woke up. Yeah, he came home from work and actually came home from the bar after work, and my mom said, I need money for groceries and she said he goes you know in his drunken slur I don't have any money I lost it all in the card game and so on and so forth and so you know she was with him for for 12 years and then that was it she couldn't take anymore and sadly her father my grandfather again who I adored I was the first grandchild 53 years old, he basically drank himself to death. So you have to, you know, so I grew up with it, with it all, before I even knew anything what the Bible says. And I don't know where you stand on this, but one of the things that just grieves my heart today is when Christians debate whether or not it's okay to drink. Um, I'll tell you, maybe some of them, if they'd have grown up in the, where I, in the environment I grew up in, there'd, there'd be no question. And I tell people all the time, if you don't take the first one, you'll never take the second one. Not given to wine. Um, there's less stuff here. We'll just try to get through it. Um, no striker. <clears throat> the idea of not quarrelsome, not, not violent, not a bully type of thing. Um, no striker. Um, not given to filthy lucre. And that's not greedy for nor pursuing um, dishonest gain. I had a cousin who was dating a guy, and, he, and he, we were talking one day, and I said, I think, I believe the Lord's calling me to be, a, to be a pastor. He said, well, I've been thinking about the ministry, too. I said, I'd never put it that way. I don't think I'm called. But he said, I've been looking at different jobs, and I, I think that's the way you can make the most money with the least amount of work. No. <laughs> he never met a fundamental pastor, I'm sure. But that, I'm seriously, that's what he said. So there's the idea of filthy lucre, right? Uh, dishonest gain. 
Now the Bible says, and you know this, the Bible says the laborer is worthy of his reward, but we must be a true laborer um, in the work of the Lord and, and for his glory and not for what we can get materially. That should never be um, the focus of our, of our life. You know, how much can I get? Um, and again, Paul's a great example. Even when he, isn't it interesting that even when he laid out in the word of God how the, the, he who preaches the gospel should live of the gospel. He talked about material things and the obligation in a way, but then he said, I've used none of these things. And he was very careful to let, to let everybody know that he wasn't in it for material gain. So there's several things there as, as a steward of God and what, what he refuses. And so we need to, to stand against these things. And we're talking about ourselves as individuals, as preachers. Um, these things need to be qualities of our life. So the things that we refuse, but then also as a steward of God in what we embrace. The things that we hold on to. Verse 8, but a lover of hospitality. So you know, again, obviously there's the, gr the grammatical thing there. There's the semicolon after Luke, filthy lucre. So not that, but in contrast, a lover of hospitality. I love it when people invite me to their house. Oh, that's not what that means, is it? I mean, I do love to go to folks' house, but it's the other way around. You know, welcoming people into our home, using what we have to encourage them and to be a testimony for the Lord. And I, and I read the, the, uh, one commentary or comment about that passage reminding me that, especially in that day, during the times of persecution, when so many Christians and even preachers were traveling to and fro and they were called strangers, in the Bible and Hebrews it says be not forgetful to entertain strangers and so we as faithful preachers of the gospel we need to have that hospitality and love it all right love it um, and then it says a lover of good men lover of that which is good is one of the primary ideas there and good men certainly apply to that a lover of good men um, good is the idea of, of good as a positive quality as opposed to bad and, and also good as a moral quality versus evil. And so it's the idea of that which is good in character which is also beneficial in effect. And, as, as, and again, as I thought about that, a lover of good men, sound men, you know, faithful men, Men who are true to the word of God. And I thought, what, is it, isn't it a, one of the great blessings of being in the ministry and being a fundamentalist is knowing good men, encouraging them, fellowshipping with them, and standing with them. And I, I know that that's one of the things in, of, the, of the American Council, that there, it's an encouragement to stand, and they do, they stand with other good men in our fellowship, the FFBC is endeavoring to do the same, um, to just to encourage good, sound, faithful men. It's wonderful. And we've been so blessed over up there in that little corner of northeast Pennsylvania, some of the men that, have, that God has brought through our doors um, to preach and, and so on, to be an encouragement to us. All right, then he says, sober, of a sound mind clear clear headed thinking clearly we think of sober as the opposite of of drunk and so they, the the idea of that word sober is free of intoxicants of any kind be able to think clearly um, sober sober men i was and i i do and, and when i was in bible school uh, in, up in canada a little school up there one of the, the, the one of the teachers i think it was history of missions class he gave us a list of like 10 requirements to be in the ministry and he listed one as a sense of humor we and especially to be able to laugh at ourselves and I have to be careful because I can see something funny and everything I don't want to be that I don't think preachers pastors should be you know jokesters and all that but there's nothing you know humor a little bit of humor and I said that because I read one time years ago in one of uh, Spurgeon's sermons on revival and he said that revival sometimes takes you know does things you wouldn't expect to do. And he said, for in one, like in one hand, 
a preacher who's always funny and joking may all of a sudden become very serious. And then he said, but also a pastor who would never crack a smile may have a little humor. I thought that was kind of interesting that he's mentioned that about how, about revival. But, you know, sober, but there is, there is, we can have a, have a good time. Um, you know, we can, we do that. <laughs> we do that. Um, but but, but our, our, our life should be characterized by a sober attitude and realizing um, the seriousness of the gospel, the seriousness of the word of God, the seriousness of our ministry, and how we do represent Christ everywhere we go. And I thought about this also, that we as pastors, we are going to be ridiculed, we are going to be despised, if we don't do, the, like if we do the things that the Bible says not to do, if we're, you know, not good men, we're going to be ridiculed for that, right? But if we do the right thing, we're still going to be ridiculed for a different reason. And I've heard it said, this is not original, if we're going to be ridiculed, it might as it should, better be for doing the right thing rather than doing the wrong thing. And the Bible does say in Second Timothy, one of the characteristics of of the age is despisers of those that are good. And then Peter says, but let none of you suffer as a thief or, you know, as a murderer, as, as a busybody. So we're going to get criticized. So ho it, it needs to be for doing the right thing, not for doing the wrong. That's the idea that blameless, they haven't got anything against us. Um, and then it has, it says, um, sober, just, I love the word just as it's used here. It's the idea of being in accord with God's standards. Righteous, upright, especially in conduct is the idea with this one. And then holy, so the word just deals especially with our conduct, our dealings. And then the word holy is the word that is, is holy and devout, uh, pure from evil, religiously right, and that's that word especially as it relates to our walk with the Lord. So our heart. And of course, holiness within a, will manifest itself in righteousness or justice without, on the outside. And then the last word in the passage is the word temperate, which means self-control, disciplined, exercising, self-restraint. Jesus said there in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. This is a tall order. It really is. In fact, it's impossible, apart from the grace of God, to be that kind of man. But by the grace of God, God knows my heart. I long to be that kind of man. I trust that you do too. Um, let's take a look, please, at one more passage, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, again, a very familiar passage, and would it not be great for God's glory if every one of us men who are in the ministry, if we could be at the end of our life like Paul was at the end of his, where he says, verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also, that love his appearing. May the Lord help us to so abide in him. It's another one of my favorite verses, 1 John 2.28, abide in him. I used to wonder when I was when a teenager and starting to really um, get serious about the things of God, I heard a preacher say, we need to be ready for the Lord's coming. And I thought, how can anybody be ready for that? Well, then the Lord, I came across that verse about, uh, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28 where uh, John says, And now little children abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So abide in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time and the word of God. I trust that it has been an encouragement to all the guys here. Lord, thank you for the men and for the ministries that are represented here. Lord, wilt thou help us 
to be faithful, to be men of godly, Christ-like character, Lord, that that might be seen, not, be, not for us, but Lord, that it might be, be you that's seen and Christ that's seen in us. Please guide us throughout the rest of this day and the rest of the conference. We ask in Christ's precious name, amen. thank Pastor Myers for the faithful exposition of the scriptures this morning. We appreciate very much the stand that he has taken for a long time now in northeastern Pennsylvania. We're going to have a time of break now. Uh, the, there are some refreshments out in the entry to the church building out behind you. Uh, and also, if you have not registered for the convention, then there's a table just through the door here where someone can help you with that. So we have a record of your attendance here. And uh, we begin our next session of the convention at 11 a.m. And we look forward to the ministry of Pastor Jonathan Smith from Iowa during that time. So we'll have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's blessing on our refreshments, and then we'll be dismissed until 11 o'clock. Our Father, we thank Thee for Thy mercy to us today. Thank Thee again for providing in Thy servants faithful exposition of Thy truth and the application of it to our own souls. We pray now for Thy blessing upon us in this time of fellowship and refreshment. Bless those things that are provided, and we pray, O Lord, that thou would govern us during this time as well, and prepare us for the session that will follow. Hear our cry, we pray, and accept our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be open in prayer by Marshall Tipton, the American Council's new chaplain endorser. All right, shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be gathered here this day. And we thank you, Lord, for the truth of thy word. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love. Our Father, we ask you, Lord, to each of us to look into our own lives as we receive encouragement from thy word of truth. Our Father, that we may be humbling unto thee and we're so grateful to thee for thy mercy, for thy grace, our Father, for thy love that you've had uh, for us all, that you gave your only begotten Son, that we might have life through thee and have it more abundantly. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the man of God that brings forth the, the truth of thy word, uh, just by the Holy Spirit, send encouragement to our hearts, and we pray that our hearts might be receptive to thee. We pray in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. I have a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, before we uh, take, uh, we'll hear a resolution, and uh, then we will receive an offering for the expenses of the convention. So I'm giving you fair warning to prepare to worship the Lord with your giving there, okay? Uh, I neglected to mention at our devotional, uh, I introduced our speaker, Justin Kaufman. If you were looking in your uh, brochure, you might have thought Brad Ryder has gotten a, uh, it's not only shorter, but uh, more compact. Um, Brad is staying down in uh, uh, Kingsport, Tennessee area for the funeral of uh, Mary Fields. And so on Saturday, I contacted Justin. I knew he was coming uh, from Maine, and I'm thankful for his ministry and for uh, helping us in that way. We have a dinner tonight. As you know, the church is supplying all three meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. To help them be able to plan for dinner this evening, we need to try to give them 
uh, some idea of how many will be attending. Uh, behind you, do not look because you will get in trouble, but behind you is my youngest son, who's bigger than us all, as I reminded us, and he will be taking count. So if you will be staying for dinner today, if you could just put your hand up, good number there. So hold those up until Josiah gives me the nod. Uh-oh, I'm seeing hands going up again. You got it? Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for that. Uh, great blessing. If you have uh, one of these booklets, it has our schedule in there on the third or fourth page. I'd just like to direct your attention to some things that we have coming up. Uh, after this, we'll have our lunch, and you have a good hour and a half, hour and three quarters for our lunch there. We'll meet back here in this room for our business meeting. That will last about an hour. And then we have our first uh, session of breakout sessions. If you'd like to know what breakout sessions you could attend, you look on the opposite page there. On Wednesday, we have two that will be offered for this afternoon. Uh, Brad Zell will present one on the International Council of Churches. And then Kevin Hobie on separation from disobedient brethren isn't still biblical. If you're not sure where classroom one and classroom two are, on the back of this, you have a little map. Uh, that gives you a direction as to where places are. Essentially, where we have lunch, just right through there are the classrooms, and you'll, you'll see that from the map there. Um, sessions are being recorded by audio. Lord willing, uh, we'll be able to post these on the Council's website soon. Several of our folks, our, our speakers, will also have handouts, and uh, you want to make sure you're able to get those, uh, because they will be a blessing. This time we're going to have uh, Brother Steve Spence uh, come and bring a resolution for our consideration this morning. Resolution on Multiculturalism. In the attempt to combat racism, Many people have swung the philosophical pendulum and embraced multiculturalism. According to the syllogism of this ideology, all ethnicities are equally good, and culture is inherently connected to ethnicity. All cultures are then deduced to be equally good. Since all cultures are equally good, multiculturalists claim that all cultures must be tolerated and or affirmed. Anyone, therefore, who criticizes a culture not his own must be labeled as an elitist, racist, ethnocentrist, paternalist, or microaggressor. And anyone who claims to depart from the intrinsic culture as ethnicity must be treated as an inauthentic traitor. As with many unbiblical philosophies, there is a grain of truth in multiculturalism, but its errors are dangerous. Many of these errors can be traced to multiculturalism's faulty minor premise, which it shares oddly with racist ideology. Semantically, ethnicity and culture are not synonymous. Ethnicity is simply a group of people who have a common ancestor. This ancestor could be traced as far back as one of Noah's three sons, Genesis 10, or he could be one of their descendants. Culture, on the other hand, is a group's way of life stemming from their shared beliefs and values. The term could be used to describe the basic way of life of humanity in general, or the particular way of life of any smaller group. Even though the two terms are not synonymous, multiculturalists still insist that they are inextric inextricably linked. Yet there is no scientific evidence for unique ethnic cultural genes regulating people's beliefs and values. There is no scriptural support for such a thing either. Therefore, instead of combating racial division, multiculturalists actually foster it by one, requiring people to rigidly adhere to ethnic biological proclivities which do not exist, and two, prohibiting people from legal legitimately appreciating, appropriating, and or condemning different cultures. The Bible furthermore states that because all men ultimately descend from Adam, Acts 17, 26, 
They are made after the similitude of God, James 3, 9b, and inherit a sin nature. No man is created more in God's image than another, and no man inherits a more depraved sin nature than another. In that sense, all men are equal. Left to this universal depravity, every imagination of the thoughts of men's hearts would be only evil continually, and the earth would be filled with violence, Genesis 6, 5, and 11. However, God at various times has granted common and saving grace unto men to restrain them from being as wicked as they could be. It is of God's sovereign good pleasure when, where, and in what proportion those unmerited gifts will be given. Some multiculturalists might claim that God always distributes those gifts equally, but scripture and history have proven otherwise. While no person or society this side of eternity entirely escapes the corruption of sin, 2 Chronicles 6, 36a, some have been, quote, more righteous, unquote, than others. And to contradict such a truth as multiculturalists do is prideful and unbiblical. Therefore, the American Council of Christian Churches at its 77th Annual Convention, October 23rd through 25th, 2018, at the Bible Presbyterian Church of Collinswood, New Jersey, resolves to denounce the philosophy of multiculturalism while maintaining a biblical position against racism. We encourage believers not to marvel at the illegitimate name-calling which the world heaps upon them when taking such a stand, for so it did before to the prophets in our Lord. Rather, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, Matthew 5, 12. Furthermore, we admonish all Christians to love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, Matthew 5, 44. By an unflinching loving witness, men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 16b. On behalf of the Executive Committee, I move the adoption of this resolution. We have a motion to accept that. Is there a second? Uh, Larry Saunders, any discussion or questions on that? All in favor of adopting this, please say aye. aye. Oppose nay. Thank you. This time we could have our ushers come for a morning offering. We make these resolutions available on our website. We also put them in a print format that would be uh, usable for your church. The council addresses uh, the key issues, needs to strive to address these issues of our day so that we can stand for the Lord and uh, be faithful to him. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this offering. Our God, we address you as the Father in heaven because you are the creator of all things. Lord, you hold all things in your hands, and we thank you that you are the giver of good gifts. Lord, help us to be ready, willing, joyful givers of what you have so graciously given to us. Use these gifts, Lord, for the furtherance of the mission of the American Council of Christian Churches Help us to have the discernment that we need, Lord, so that we can helpfully draw attention to key issues of our day and encourage one another to take the right stand. We ask your blessing on this offering for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.
Our speaker is Jonathan Tip. I knew I was going to mess that up. I was either going to say Jonathan Tipton or Jonathan Peters, and it's Jonathan Smith. We have uh, Marshall Tipton, and you could say, how could I mess that up? Well, Jonathan Smith is from Tipton, Iowa. And uh, so I tried. I even wrote it down here, and I still failed. But uh, Jonathan Smith has grown up in Tipton, Iowa. He has the privilege of serving as the pastor of the church that he grew up in, Tipton Bible Church. He serves as the administrator of their Christian school, and last I checked, also as the president of their state association of Christian schools, and he serves faithfully as a secretary of the American Council of Christian Churches. His parents have been active in, in uh, the American Council of Christian Churches for decades. Uh, Richard Smith was, was he a secretary also of the American Council? So he is following in his father's footsteps in, that, in, many, in many ways. But uh, we're thankful for the Smiths, their faithfulness to the Lord, and we look forward to hearing the word of God. So, brother. Thank you, Brother Dan. It's my joy and privilege to preach the Word of God to you this morning. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 1. We'll continue on from where our brother left off. Titus 1, and our text is found in verses 9 through 16. Titus 1. Verses 9 through 16. In setting forth the qualifications of the bishop, speaking of the office of elder or pastor, verse 9 concludes the pastoral qualifications with this doctrinal qualification, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's look to the Lord in prayer before we consider his word together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you this morning for the greatness of who you are. There is no God like you. Thank you, Lord. You are a holy God. We come into your presence with fear and trembling, but also with great thanksgiving because of the great salvation that you have provided to us through Jesus Christ. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Lord, we thank you that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone, not of works, lest any man should boast. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and encourage one another as preachers to hold fast the faithful word. Father, we thank you for the word that has already been given to us and strengthened and encouraged our hearts. And we pray now again that you would quiet our hearts before you, 
that you would strengthen us. Fill me with your spirit. Use your word in each heart, each life, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Our theme this morning is the opposition of the faithful preacher of the gospel. As we consider the theme before us in this hour, the the opposition of the faithful preacher of the gospel, we are fully aware of a vast array of opposition that we frequently encounter as preachers of the gospel. Even as the apostle Paul said concerning his ministry in Ephesus, that a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And of his ministry in Macedonia, he said, Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. As preachers of the gospel, we've had a taste of that experience. We face the temptation of our own flesh. We face the pull of the world that would suck us into the thinking and the practices of the ungodly like a tornado sucking its unsuspecting victims into the swirling worldly debris of confusion and spiritual destruction. We face the pressures of balancing preaching and church administration, family, and the care of our flocks. We encounter varying degrees of pressure to conform to this world, both in our own lives and also in our ministries. We face the ever-present temptation to grow cold and callous toward what is spiritual and eternal. We face the giants of prayerlessness and unbelief. And oh, how numerous are the signals that we have given in to these besetting sins. We see it in our misplaced priorities. And above all, in our lack of love and devotion to the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Andrew Bonar said, quote, One of the gravest perils which besets the ministry is a restless scattering of energies over an amazing multiplicity of interest which leaves no margin of time and of strength for receptive and absorbing communion with God. End quote. All of these and many others deserve a careful consideration under the topic of our theme. But I would focus our attention on the opposition that is addressed in Titus 1, 9 through 16. Verse 9 says, Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Brethren, we have a high and a holy calling. The essence of that calling is the faithful proclamation of the word of God. Preaching is not popular in the church today. The time is here and the time is now when men will not endure sound doctrine. And in that refusal to endure the sound doctrine of God's word, the multitudes of our day have flocked by the thousands to follow after preachers like Billy Graham and Robert Schuller. And now that those men have passed off the scenes, others rise in their room such as Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, Carl Lentz of Hillsong, and many others. Why? Because people want to have their ears tickled. They want to hear a positive message. In reality, they want a message that is centered on man, not on God. But in contrast to the spirit of our day, As preachers of the gospel, we are told to hold fast the faithful word. And what is it here that forms the primary opposition to the preacher of the gospel? We see it at the end of verse 9. It is called the gainsayers. The word translated gainsayers is a compound word made up of the word for speak and the word against. It means to speak against. And what is it they speak against? They speak against the faithful word. We see in this passage, first of all, number one, the character of the opposition. 
In verse 10, we see the proclamation of their character. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. This is who they are. This is what they are like. They are unruly. They are rebellious, insubordinate, disobedient. In short, brethren, they are not submitted to God or to his word. They are not submitted to God-given authority. They are not to s- submitted to the word of God, which they constantly speak against. This quality is exactly the opposite of what God requires in the faithful pastor. And back in verse 6, even the children of the pastor are not to be accused of riot or unruly. God calls us to be submitted to him, to his word, and to that structure of authority that he has ordained for our accountability and protection. But the gainsayers follow the godless character of this crooked generation. We watch the news, and every time we turn it on, every day, we are reminded again of the increasing unruly nature of this society. Where is there evidence any respect and submission toward God-ordained authority? We are speeding headlong toward anarchy and mob rule. And we are now witnessing this lack of submission among those in the church who presume to speak against the word. We see this in the contemporary churches of our day because they're not challenged to fully submit themselves to the word of God. They pick and choose from the word according to that which most conveniently fits their agenda. And sadly, we see it sometimes in our own churches, in individuals who do not like to submit themselves to the preaching of the Word of God. Instead of reflecting the light of Christ in this world, they reflect the character of this world in the church. And if the Lord tarries, we will see an even greater increase of unruly, rebellious behavior in the church. The gainsayers are not submissive. The gainsayers are also called vain talkers in verse 10. Vain talkers. They may be very articulate and fluent in their speech. They may appear to be knowledgeable, wise, and discerning. They may be very influential in their speech, but if they are speaking against the word, it is vain talk. It is empty words, hot air. And furthermore, it is impossible for their vain words to accomplish anything that is truly spiritually profitable for anybody. And the shelves of our bookstores, Christian bookstores, are lined with vain talk. It is significant that the word for vain is often connected with idolatry in the scriptures. Can there be anything more empty than worshiping as God what has been created in the mind and imagination of man? The contemporary churches of today have replaced the faithful preaching of God's word with worldly entertainment, worldly philosophies, a mix of of vaguely Christian principles and secular psychology. They have deliberately chosen to exalt experience and emotion and personalities rather than the solid foundation of sound doctrine. Essentially, they have shifted their focus from God to man. That's what they've done. From the word to the world. Our society is utterly immersed in humanism. The worship of man... The world of our day worships sports stars, movie stars, music stars, politicians, academics, and business tycoons. Their doctrine is believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. And the church of today has welcomed in the humanism of the world with open arms. They say they're worshiping God. But don't forget the next characteristic we see in verse 10. 
They are deceivers. They are deceivers. They're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They have allowed to creep into their worship of God, the worship of man. They applaud their musicians. They applaud their dramas. They applaud the preaching, if you can call it that. And I would suggest to you that there is an awful lot of the praise of man going on under the thinly veiled guise of praising God. I have no doubt that many are deceived into thinking they are worshiping God, but they are indoctrinated in the humanism of our day. Instead of exalting Christ and the word of God, they have exalted the philosophies and opinions and achievements of man. How utterly foolish and vain is the worship of man. Psalm 39 verse 5 says, Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. In verse 10, Paul particularly identifies they of the circumcision. And we are reminded here that the truth of the gospel is at stake. He speaks of, of those Judaizers who taught that we are saved by faith in Christ plus the works of the law. Catholicism and, and all the mainline denominations of our day follow the basic same false doctrine. It is a doctrine of grace plus works. The work of Christ plus the works of man. Millions upon millions are deceived by this doctrine of man. Millions upon millions are plunging right into the pit of hell because they are trusting in themselves instead of the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. In verse 12, we see the proof of their character. Verses 12, in the beginning of verse 13, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Someone once gave me a commentary on the book of Titus by one Thomas Oden, who taught at Drew University here in New Jersey. Now, Oden posed this question concerning verse 12. Quote, How did the apostle deal with those who put down another race by unfair characterizations? He went on to say, this was another sad example of marginalized peoples being dismissed by stereotyping. Paul insisted that if Cretan Christians did nothing to oppose those in Crete who would deceive others, this would only reinforce the unfortunate stereotype and seem to make it more plausible. End quote. What utter nonsense! It was not a sad example of marginalized people. It was a sad example of a godless, sinful culture. And Paul appealed to the well-known writing of a Cretan prophet poet named Epimenides in order to confirm the widely acknowledged sins of that culture. He wasn't going out of his way to offend the Cretans, but he was confronting, contradicting, counteracting that wicked culture with the standard of God's word. There are those in the church today that would have us think that culture is neutral, that culture can be redeemed, that we must somehow accept and embrace culture in order to win people to Christ. But they fail to fully recognize the problem of the sin nature of man. All cultures of men are inevitably corrupted by the sin nature of man. That's why we must faithfully preach Christ to this sinful world. Christ is the only answer. Christ is the only one who can save us, forgiving us our sins and changing our lives for his glory. Paul in verse 12 condemns the known sins of the Cretan society, they are liars, evil beasts, emphasizing their sensuality and violence, slow bellies or lazy gluttons. They were living for themselves and for the things of this earth. Does that sound familiar to you? That sounds a lot like the society that we live in today, doesn't it? 
In Paul's day, the Cretan character was so widely recognized that to Cretize meant to lie or to deceive. But here Paul applied these cultural sins to the character and actions of the false teachers. It is significant to notice that it was the gainsayers who were notably manifesting the very same sins and excesses of their godless society. And so it is today. About a year ago, Christianity Today announced the retirement of Bill Hybels from the Willow Creek Community Church. Hybels was replaced by two lead pastors, Steve Carter and Heather Larson. Now, Hybels said this about the decision, quote, when we saw this shaping up, we had to ask ourselves, can our congregation have a lead pastor that's a woman? And because this is a deeply held value in our church, we said, no problem, end quote. We notice that they didn't ask God what he thinks about it. They asked themselves and they answered themselves. In fact, they completely ignored what God says about it in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 15 and other passages. But you see, instead of holding fast the faithful word, they have embraced the godless culture of this world. They've already decided that the deeply held values of this crooked generation means more to them than the word of the living God. The word of God is not their only rule of faith and practice. The culture is. We consider also the pretense of their character. They are deceivers, liars. If you will not hold fast to the faithful word, you inevitably place yourself on the side of false doctrine and deceit. Look at verse 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. There's an allusion here to the Jewish element of these false teachers who emphasized purification ceremonies and other rituals. Oh yes, they made a great outward show of spirituality. But the inward reality of their hearts was that they were defiled and unbelieving. Even their mind and conscience was defiled. You see, God's word exposes what we really are. All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. But today we see the same fleshly gravitation to that which is outward and physical instead of coming to Christ in faith and repentance, being cleansed by him from the inside out, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So we have seen the character of the opposition, and now we consider the conduct that flows out of that character. Number two, the conduct of the opposition. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Here's the practice of the opposition. They subvert whole houses or households. Subvert here is to turn upside down, to overthrow. Whole households were overthrown by these gainsayers. They were overthrowing the faith of entire families by speaking against God's word with deceptive, empty talk. We might think, oh, what's, on the books? what's, up? what's in those books, those modern books, and what they're hearing on the Christian radio stations? Uh, you know, we don't agree with that, but uh, that's okay. Our, our people won't pay attention. They're having influence among our people, brethren. The devil is very deceptive. It is possible here that the reference to whole houses may refer to the gatherings of local bodies of believers. The early church primarily gathered together at the houses of their members. If that is what is in view, what a deadly effect this was having as entire assemblies of believers were influenced by these gainsayers. And we reflect on the fact of how many assemblies of believers today have been deceived 
and led astray by the wisdom of man. They have failed to hold fast the faithful word. Verse, further in verse 11, we see that they accomplish this overthrow by teaching things which they ought not. Instead of teaching the truth of God's word, they teach things that God has not said. They teach what ultimately elevates the works of man and diminishes the work of Christ and denies the authority of the word of God. And why do they do it? Verse 11. For filthy lucre's sake. And we see here the prophet of the opposition teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They were greedy of dishonest gain. It, it, it's easy for us to point our fingers at the usual suspects, like Benny Hinn and Creflo Dollar, uh, among many others. But brethren, how carefully we must guard our own hearts from covetousness and greed. Our doctrine can be straight as an arrow, but if we allow greed to come in and take over our hearts, our doctrine will not stay straight. It was greed that ruined Judas and motivated him to betray the Lord. And oh, how many have betrayed the truth of God's word because of greed. We can be tempted, brethren, to soften our tone and shift our stand in order to keep people who otherwise would leave our ministries. Or we might reason, as so many have, that, that if we just loosen up our music and focus on the more positive messages from the Word, that we could attract more people. And after all, wouldn't that give us the possibility of reaching more people and potentially gaining a much wider audience? Do you know what that sounds like to me? The reasoning of Billy Graham. And we know where that road took his doctrine. Sadly, how many multitudes of ministers have followed his example. But brethren, we have been called to feed the flock of God which is among us, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. By the grace of God, we need to determine that we're going to love the Lord. That, that we are going to serve him, that we're going to love his truth instead of loving money and loving the praise of men. Our message ought to be the same proclamation of the whole counsel of God, whether we are preaching to five people or 500 people. We can stand for Christ. We can hold fast the faithful word, trusting that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. God is faithful. We see the product of the opposition in verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. What is it that these Jewish fables and commandments of men produce in the hearts and lives of those that listen to them? They turn people away from the truth of God. That is what God says concerning any religion or denomination that adds the necessity of man's work to the message of God's grace in Christ. They turn people from the truth. Paul testified that God sent him to the Gentiles to turn men from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. But the gainsayers do the exact opposite. They turn the, their listeners' ears to the commandments of men and thus inevitably they turn them away from the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. In Christ alone. The work of Christ is complete. On the cross he said, it is finished. He is risen in victory. Do not add anything to what he has done. Likewise, the word of God is complete. To add or take away from it is to turn men away from the truth. 
We see the profession of the opposition in verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient in unto every good work reprobate. Here the truth is unveiled concerning the men and women who speak against the word. They can say whatever they want about how close they are to Jesus, about their own relationship with the Lord. They profess, they make this confession. That's the word here. It's a word that means to say the same thing as. They may use some of the same language as believers. They claim they know God, but what they do in their lives categorically denies their profession. All that we have already seen that marks their character and conduct reveals what they really are, abominable, which means they are disgusting and detestable to God. They are disobedient. All the flowery language of their oratory, all their effectiveness in relating their message to those that follow them cannot change the fact that they are disobedient to God and his word. And unto every good work reprobate. They are disqualified. They are disapproved after testing. And Jesus said concerning the false teachers, by their works ye shall know them. We notice also the proliferation of the opposition back in verse 10. For there are many, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. There are many all around us today. We can think of the whole host of false teachers all over the world, as well as the enormous number of disobedient evangelical brothers who in various ways speak against the authority and the truth of God's word. About a month ago, I was catching up on the news online, and I stumbled onto this article from Fox News, September 23rd, 2018, written by Andy Stanley the son of the Southern Baptist preacher, Charles Stanley. The article was titled, Five Reasons People Leave the Church. That one got my attention. But listen to what Andy Stanley said. Quote, Many expressions of Christianity are fatally flawed. Many people see Christianity as anti-intellectual, overly simplistic, and easily discredited. The new evangelicals have been worried about that for years. For decades, he says, college professors with biases against religion have found Christian freshmen easy targets. Much of what makes American Christianity so irresistible to those outside the faith are things we should have been resisting all along. While many of us have been working hard to make church more interesting, Hope you guys have been doing that. I'm just kidding. He goes on to say, it turns out that fewer people are actually interested. Here are five reasons people are leaving the church. I could only stomach one of them. Number one, we tell people that the Bible is the basis of Christianity. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a line that many who grew up in the church know by heart, and it reflects a problem in modern American Christianity. Many of us believe that the Bible is the foundation of our religion. I recently read a blog post by a former worship leader who left the faith after she read a book proving contradictions in the Bible. Apparently, she grew up believing the foundation of our faith is a non-contradicting book. It's not. Jesus is. When our faith stands on anything other than Christ, we put ourselves and others in position to fall. End quote. That is a gainsayer. You cannot divorce Jesus Christ from his word. If you are speaking against his word, you are speaking against Christ. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And he has magnified his word above all his name. It is the written word. 
that accurately reveals the living word. This word that Andy Stanley implies is filled with contradictions is the word of Christ. The real contradiction is found in the writing of Andy Stanley and many others like him. As we think of the many gainsayers that speak against the faithful word, there is a plethora of ways and means by which this gainsaying is done. That there are more varieties, shades, and nuances of gainsaying than there are flavors of eminence. A few years ago, my family and I visited New York City, and yes, they could tell we were from Iowa. We went to the huge M&M store in Times Square. Oh, what a dazzling array of chocolate uh, is found in that place from top to bottom. But I say there are more varieties of gainsaying in the church today. And some of it may be very attractively packaged and all of it is carefully sugar-coated to make it appealing to as many people as possible. But all of those varieties of gainsaying have the same corrupt poison on the inside. And we recognize here the power of the opposition. They all derive their very source in energy from the one who said to Eve in the garden, Hath God said? To cast doubt and aspersion on the word of God is what the devil is all about. And we need to be reminded afresh that this is not a game that he plays. He does not energize and inspire the gainsayers to speak against the word for the purpose of lifting up the education and scholarship of man to a higher level. He does not do it in order that men might be more understanding of other viewpoints, more open and accepting of ideas, and thus more at peace with a greater number of people in the world. He certainly does not do it to promote true love and harmony in the church. But rather, folks, the devil is the one who energizes the gainsayers to question, deny, and minimize the word of God and the faithful preaching of the word. And he does it in order to deceive and destroy. He is a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. He is a liar and the father of it. It was his gainsaying to Eve, hath God said, that plunged the whole world into sin and death. And so he is at work today making himself appear as an angel of light, transforming his ministers into the ministers of righteousness, that they might continue the work he started when he said, hath God said. Be sober. Be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. In the midst of the fierce attacks of our adversary, we are called to hold fast the faithful word, unfailing, unflinching. God calls his preachers to a stubborn tenacity. He calls men who will not melt before the opposition. And so we see, number three, the confrontation of the opposition. How are we to respond to the, to the opposition that we face, to those who speak against the word? Verse 11, <clears throat> whose mouths must be stopped. This is the prohibition of the opposition whose mouths must be stopped. It is necessary to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. But above and beyond the realization of the terrible impact their gainsaying has on other people is the fact that their mouths must be stopped because they are openly, brazenly speaking against Almighty God. They are contradicting the holy word of the living God. It is nothing but high-handed, double-fisted rebellion against God. We realize also that what is true of them is true of all sinners who stand condemned before a holy God. Romans 3.19 says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. 
as we contemplate the necessity of stopping the mouths of the gainsayers, we acknowledge that it is a task we must undertake with humility. For when the Spirit of God graciously opens to us the truth of his word, it is then, brethren, that we behold the glory of God and the greatness of our Savior. We see the revelation of the holiness of the triune God. And in stark contrast, we see the wretchedness of our own spiritual condition before a holy God. And we cry out with Isaiah the prophet, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Brethren, there is no worthiness in us. There is nothing superior in us. But only by his grace we have been saved and cleansed and called to this glorious work of proclaiming the word of God. We therefore embrace this great task laid upon us humbly, yet boldly, knowing as Psalm 63, 11 says, the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speaketh lies shall be stopped. Therefore, we hold fast to the faithful word. We come in the name of Christ. We speak with the authority of Christ. It is the one who has all power in heaven and earth who bids us stop the mouths of the gainsayers. And this we must do without pride, without timidity, and without apology. The word of the Lord has spoken it. We are called to faithfulness to the word and faithfulness to Christ. In our text, we see also the protest of the opposition. Verse 13, their mouths must be stopped, must be muzzled, but how are we to stop their mouths? By force? By laws? By duct tape, perhaps? Brother Dan, I just had this idea. We could have ACC duct tape with Titus 111 uh, printed on it. How about that? But verse 13 elaborates on the stopping of their mouths. Verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Yes, they may say what they will. They may freely speak against the word of God. But they should never be able to do so without being rebuked sharply by the faithful preacher of the word. Rebuke them sharply. Rebuke means to convict, to refute, to expose, to find fault with. The root of the word sharply means to cut. The surgeon's knife cuts out the cancer or the disease and so must the faithful pastor use the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. But truly, it is not us who does the cutting and the convicting. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We must simply proclaim the word. Speak of the truth of God's word in response to those who speak against it. And the purpose is this, verse 13, that they may be sound in the faith. The goal, the purpose of the sharp rebuke of gainsayers is that those who hear the rebuke might be sound in the faith. Sound refers to being healthy. There is a lot of sickness and disease in the church today because of all of the gainsayers. We are called to rebuke the gainsayers in order that God's truth might bring spiritual life to God's people. People don't like to be rebuked. It's not popular. That's not nice. That's not loving. That's not even Christian, according to some. But the truth is, 
that for those who are infected by the gainsayers, there will be no spiritual health for them without the surgery of the sharp rebuke of God's word. Verse 13 this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. The faith refers to the whole body of truth that is taught by the word and confessed by those who believe it. It is the faithful word in verse 9, literally according to the teaching, the faith in verse 13, the truth in verse 14. But we notice here that our main duty in confronting the opposition is this in verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We see now number four, the conquest of the opposition. It is the power of the word that assures the victory. A.T. Robertson defines this word for holding fast in the present tense middle voice as holding oneself face to face with. What a picture that is, that, that amidst all of the opposition of the gainsayers, we are continually to keep ourselves face to face with a faithful word. This word is faithful. It is reliable. It is trustworthy. This word is our strength. It is our stability. And it is the source of our effective ability both to exhort God's people and to convince the gainsayers. Calvin said the pastor ought to have two voices. One for gathering the sheep and another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. The scripture supplies him with the means of doing both. We need to soberly reflect upon what it is that we continually hold before our face. The eternal immutable word of God or the ever shifting winds of man's opinion and man's praise. Sometimes we get weary in this great battle. But our text reveals that our ability to exhort and to convince the gainsayers comes from holding fast the faithful word according to the doctrine. The power is in the word. And also we may be encouraged, brethren, that there is a faithful remnant who has gone before us, who held fast the faithful word in their time. What a blessing. It has been to be here at Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood. This place is rich with our history. It was Dr. McIntyre who taught the truths of biblical separation to my father and to the founding father of the Tipton Bible Church. And in the ACCC, we have such a heritage of faithful men who have gone before Pastor Don McKnight, Dr. Ralph Colas, Pastor Mark Franklin, Brother Al Martin, and so many others down through the years who have faithfully fought the good fight of faith. In looking through some of the old ACC files that belong to my dad, I found an ACC publication from 1970 called Accent. And in it were written these words, quote, it is obvious then that the new evangelicals of today ought to indeed be grateful that someone in the past stood for the faith of our fathers in the face of the horrendous assault on the fundamentals by the prophets of liberal theology. Fundamentalist faults are stressed out of all proportion to their faithfulness to God and his infallible word. The real issue is and will be before the judgment seat of Christ have we been faithful to the word of God? Question mark. End of quote. The word of God is to be the standard. Not the shifting tides of human opinion. Not the cultures of this world in which the contemporary evangelical churches of our day are so firmly planted. Fashioned after the models of business and entertainment where doctrine is pushed to the back pew, if not entirely thrown out with both the pews and the hymn books. But brethren, 
In the midst of all of the compromising gainsaying of our day, we must be men of the word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In our text, we notice the present tense verbs are used throughout, signifying to us that we need to continually hold fast the faithful word. We think of the example of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 who said, We gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. And it should not matter to us if the face of that opposition is well known and well respected among us, not even if we have to reprove someone like the Apostle Peter. Paul said, I withstood him to the face because he walked not according to the truth of the gospel. And yes, our tone and approach will will vary depending on whether we're dealing with the sheep or the wolves. But we must hold fast the faithful word. We remember that Satan is a master deceiver. He's a master at mixing truth and error. We must be so diligent, so alert. We hear evangelicals today talking about contextualizing the gospel or resetting the gospel for our culture and I understand there are some different nuances of those terms but I'll be honest with you those terms really disturb me because in the first place my father taught me to be highly suspicious of any term or concept you can't easily find in the Bible but above all that language disturbs me because the truth of God's Word is timeless and eternal. It doesn't need to be contextualized or reset. It's perfect the way it is. Because the eternal God gave it through all time and all people. There are some who are using these terms to promote using even the sinful elements of our culture to attempt to attract people to church and to Christianity. And that is called unbiblical compromise. What mission did Jesus give us in Matthew 28, 19, and 20? He tells us to make disciples of all nations, to baptize in his name, and to teach all things whatsoever he has commanded. He did not say that from time to time we will need to reset the gospel. He did not indicate that we as a human race would would someday arrive at an advanced development and would therefore require a different method or a different message. That's not what he said. He did say that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Christ has commissioned us to make disciples, baptizing and teaching all things he has commanded, and in doing so he has promised that he will be with us always, even unto the consummation of the age. There is no change in his plan, his purpose, or his proclamation. Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And let it be the Spirit of the Lord, not the Spirit of this world, that teaches us the way that His truth needs to be presented to the world of our day. The work of God in hearts and lives is not our work. It is the Spirit of God who in every generation convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment by the power of the Word of God. We can become disheartened in this great battle. We can sometimes feel or sense pressure to minimize the centrality of preaching in the church in a variety of of subtle ways. You might hear a casual comment about reducing the number of preaching services, as so many churches have done. We face the ridicule and scorn of peers over our stand for the biblical doctrine of separation. And sometimes we face the challenge of individuals in our assemblies who have given place to the devil in their lives and are used by him to create division and opposition to the preaching of the word. It is painful for us, brethren, to see some whom we have known and loved capitulate 
and compromise. It gives us pause. But we are called to be faithful to God, not man. Faithful to the word of God, not the word of man. When the opposition comes, and it comes from every side, when men and women arise speaking against the word, we are to hold fast the faithful word. We are to cling to the word with all our hearts. We are to own this word as that alone, which is our only rule of faith and practice. Though the winds of hell may blow, though the enemy come in like a flood, we must continually hold fast to the faithful word as we have been taught. And in this great conquest, we are strengthened not only by the power of the word, but also by the presence of Christ. We have fears and struggles in this battle. Sometimes we are weak and weary in the conflict. We are in and of ourselves not equal to this task. But there is one who is with us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. The contradiction there is from the same root of the word gainsayer in our text. He endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Look to Christ, brethren. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. In the heat of the battle, in the midst of the fiercest opposition, brethren, we must never forget what side we are on. It is ours to proclaim and defend the word of the living God. They can burn this book, but its truth will never be extinguished. They can deny this book, but every jot and tittle of this word will be fulfilled. They can lock the preachers of the word in prison, but the word of God is not bound. They can persecute us, but the word will prevail. They can even execute us, but the word will live on and continue to spread. The word of God is victorious. The truth of God will conquer all. The Lord of hosts is has spoken it. The God who cannot lie, the one who spoke of the world into existence and upholds all things by the word of his power. I love that old familiar poem called The Anvil of God's Word. Last eve, I paused before a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime and looking in I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all those hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed. The hammer's gone. C.H. Spurgeon, in relating the testimony of John Bunyan, said, Remember John Bunyan? When he refused to give up preaching, they put him in prison and said to him, Mr. Bunyan, you can come out of prison whenever you will promise to cease preaching the gospel. He said, If you let me out of prison today, I will preach again tomorrow by the grace of God. And when they told him that they would not let him out until he promised not to preach, he bravely answered, If I lie in jail till the moss grows on my eyelids, I will never conceal the truth which God has taught me. May that be our testimony in the midst of our opposition that by the grace of God, we will never conceal the truth which God has taught us. Stay the course, brethren. Hold fast the faithful word.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege to preach the holy, living, infallible, inerrant word of God. And Father, we pray that you would help us to put on the whole armor of God that we might withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We pray it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, brother. We have been fed the word uh, well this morning, and I hope that you've been challenged and exhorted, um, encouraged as well. We have opportunity to partake of uh, food to give us more strength. Uh, before we have our business meeting, and Jonathan Smith makes that motion for American Council duct tape, I'd rather just keep with the word myself. But <laughs> Uh, if you could make your way over, they are ready for us now, and uh, the, the ladies that were there made very clear to me they do not uh, like to keep things cold, so don't get me in trouble. Please make your way over there uh, in an expeditious fashion. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our uh, lunch today. Thank you, God, for this food from your word that we have heard. Beginning, Lord, with our great Savior then seeing, Lord, the character that we must have. And now, Lord, uh, being apprised from your word of the opponents that we face, Lord, thank you that we need not fear, we never need tremble, nor, Lord, bend and give in. But we must, Lord, trust in your word, trust in your grace, and thank you, Lord, for the reminder of trusting and relying on the person of Christ. As we, Lord, enjoy some time of fellowship around the table, give us physical strength. Thank you for these hands that have so graciously uh, provided for the food. Uh, use it to give us physical strength, and may we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. I'll see you here back here at uh, 145 for a business meeting.